Welcome everyone to the Orangeburg Board of Commissioners regular meeting October 15, 2019. At this time I'll ask uh, City Clerk Beth Cecil to please call the roll. Commissioner Jeff Sanford. Here. Commissioner Larry Condor. Here. Mayor Tom Watson. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Larry Magliner. Here. Commissioner Pam Smith Wright. Here. This time I'll ask you to please stand for the invocation and the pledge. Tonight's prayer is a little bit different. It's for one of our own and his family who have experienced a pretty heavy load to carry these last few days, the Pickerel family. Jason, we pray for you and your family for the sudden loss of your father, Gary. We ask God to give you strength and courage in this time of grieving. We ask our Heavenly Father to send you peace. And for all those who are mourning, please continue to surround them with family and friends and loved ones that can offer each other comfort during these difficult times. Father, please help them to remove the heaviness that is in their heart and give them strength to know day by day, with God's help, it will get better. As we pray for the loss of your father, we hope you can draw on that strength as you and your family deal with your daughter Roxy's surgery. Please know that you have the support of so many people who love you and love her. We are so thankful for God's grace and his guidance to the doctors and their team who provided the skills needed to perform such a critical operation on your precious Roxy. We ask and pray for a speedy and successful recovery in God's name. Please join me in saying, Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the new flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, we're going to skip retirements because I'm not really in the mood for doing all. No, just kidding. <laughs> it is interesting to note that uh, the retirement uh, combined years of service is 87 years for us, our community. So, for that, we are truly grateful. So, I'm going to do these one by one. I'm going to come out front, play with the mic, give you the recognition you so justly deserve. Okay, first one tonight, Chris Curtis. I knew Chris when he was nine years old. He played Little League Baseball for me. That's how long I've known Chris. He joined the U.S. Army slash National Guard in 1989. In October of 99, Chris was hired by the Hornsboro Fire Department and was promoted to driver engineer in 2004. 2006-2007, Chris, a recipient of the Bronze Star Medal, was deployed to Baghdad and then retired from the Army National Guard in 2008. Chris was promoted to Lieutenant in 2010 and eventually stationed at Station 2. Thank you, Chris, for your service to our country and to the city of Orangeboro. Chris? Thank you. 
Okay, next one is engineer Chuck Pedley. He was hired by the, with the uh, Owensboro Fire Department in August 1993. Engineer Pedley promoted to driver engineer in August 2003. Engineer Pedley has been a model employee of the Owensboro Fire Department. He is the driver engineer of ladder truck five stationed on the south end of Owensboro at station five. Engineer Pedley has always been a leader when it comes to providing training to new firefighters on the operations of the ladder truck. He will be leaving the city of Orangeboro with a little over 26 years of service. He will be missed. All those who reside in the city of Orangeboro are asked to join in this recognition of appreciation on this 15th day of October 2019. <laughs> 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 Okay, now we move to the police department. Major Gordon Black began his law enforcement career in 1993 with the Henderson Police Department. He joined the Orangeboro Police Department in 1998 where he has served in many positions over the last 21 years. Major Black is a native of Orangeboro, graduated from Orangeboro Senior High in 1987. He continued his education at Kentucky Wesleyan College where he earned a Bachelor's of Arts degree in criminal justice in 1992. Major Black also holds a master's degree in public administration from Western Kentucky University that he earned in 2012. While at OPD, he served in the patrol division as a patrolman and training officer. He later worked as a detective in the criminal investigation division for four years before being promoted to sergeant. He returned to the patrol division and worked as sergeant and lieutenant. As a lieutenant, Gordon was assigned the professional standards unit Major Black has served as the commander of the Support Services Division the last three years. Major Black has received 15 various awards for his outstanding dedication and service during his career at OPD. Certificate of Outstanding Service hereby recognizes Major Gordon Black and extends its grateful appreciation for your outstanding service faithfully rendered while employed by the City of Orangeboro 1998 to 2019. All those who reside in the city of Orangeboro, Kentucky are asked to join this recognition of appreciation on this 15th day of October 2019. Gardon. not going to take up any time. It's been an honor and a pleasure serving the uh, community of Owensboro all these years, and I'm going to miss everybody. OK. 
Okay. That was fun. Business. Okay. Item number five. I'd like for you to consider the approval of minutes from dated October the 1st, 2019. Could I have a motion to approve, please? So moved. Could I have a second? Second. second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 All opposed, motion carries. Thank you. <laughs> Item 5B, consider board appointments. Orangeboro Davis County Industrial Development Authority appoint Robert M. Barry to fill the remainder of an unexpired term, which ends April the 3rd, 2022. He'll be filling Chief K's uh, spot. Chief's been on there for a long time and said he'd uh, like to relinquish that to a younger body. Apollo Neighborhood Alliance reappoints Suzette Austin, Bruce, uh-oh, Hoop, and Susie Hoop. Two-year terms expiring October the 22nd, 2021. I'll make a motion to approve. Could I have a second, please? Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor indicate by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, motion carries. Item six, are ordinances. Second reading, there will be a roll call vote. Counselor. Thank you, Mayor. You're welcome. Uh, ordinance 31-2019, an ordinance annexing to the city of Owensboro certain unincorporated territory in the county of Davis adjoining the present boundary line of the city, being property owned by Cedarhurst of Owensboro Real Estate, LLC, and located at 1900 Pleasant Valley Road, containing seven acres more or less. Publicly read for approval on second reading this 15th day of October, 2019. Okay, I'll make a motion to approve. Second. Okay, city manager, do you have any comments? Uh, no, Mayor, is the, uh, well, briefly, as the city attorney referenced, this is second reading of a consensual annexation of the Cedarhurst project. We discussed it in greater detail at our last meeting. I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. It's a big deal. It's a good company, and it's a well-needed uh, facility that our community really does need. Okay, let's roll call. City. Commissioner Jeff Sanford? Yes. Commissioner Larry Condor? Yes. Mayor Tom Watson? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Larry Maglinger? Yes. Commissioner Pam Smith Wright? Aye. Thank you. Welcome, Cedarhurst, to Owensboro. Item 7, ordinance is the first reading. There will be no vote. Counselor? Ordinance number 32-2019. A supplemental ordinance providing for the authorization and issuance of electric light and power system refunding revenue bonds in one or more series in the aggregate principal amount of not to exceed $80 million of the City of Owensboro, Kentucky for the purpose of refunding certain outstanding revenue bonds of said city, authorizing the sale of said bonds to the purchaser thereof identified herein, provided for the security and payment of said bonds and interest thereon from the available income and revenues of the municipal electric light and power system of said city, providing for the de defeasance of certain revenue bonds of the city and providing for certain other matters in connection therewith. Introduced and publicly read on first reading this 15th day of October, 2019. Thank you, Councillor. At this time, we'll have an OMU presentation by the leader. Good evening, I'm Kevin Frizzell, 11710 Fields Road South, Utica, Kentucky. And I've got a uh, hopefully brief presentation uh, to uh, explain this, uh, this action, this ordinance we've got before you tonight. And I'll start out, um, it, um, I have the clicker, uh, with a brief overview. Um, as we were here in, in um, April to talk about the first phase of this plan, so we do five-year financial forecasts and the last update we did uh, in we were here we talked about the one we did in November 2018 we've recently updated that forecast so we'll talk about that the good news on that forecast I've put that slide right up front is we still are projecting our res, our uh, overall electric rates to go down in each of the next five fiscal years would you mind repeating that sir <laughs> uh, we're still projecting the our electric rates to go down in the, each of the next five fiscal years outstanding That's, uh, so what we've completed so far is, as you guys approved and our commission approved in April, a $3.1 million, $3 million bond defeasance. We paid off some bonds. Uh, we, uh, with your approval, raised our base rate on June 1, but we also lowered our ECA rate on June 1. Uh, so those th two things in, in combination, we did lower our, our electric rates on June 1 of 2019 this past June as well. And then phase two is what we're going to talk about tonight, our bond refunding and redemption, uh, the second part of that to, uh, to have this plan move forward. 
So before we get that, I want to talk a little bit, just give you a brief overview. We just ended our fiscal year 19, a brief overview of the financials for the, for the electric and water utility, uh, update on some of our projects we've got going on, and then we'll discuss the uh, refunding and redemption. Uh, so this is our consolidated electric system operating revenue for the year ended May 31. And uh, my eyes aren't good enough to see the screen, so I'm going to have to use my... I see 2.6% below budget. 2.6% below budget on, on revenues, uh, which is very close to budget. Uh, and then the next slide, you can see our expenses uh, were uh, about 6% below budget. So uh, our expenses were, were, were below, well below our budget and uh, overcame the uh, lower revenues than budget. And you can see on the expenses, the blue bar is that our largest expense on the, on the electric side is purchase power and power production. And right now, that's all the production we get from Elmer Smith Station. So uh, the, the end result of that is we had budgeted for a net income uh, before the city transfer of about $12 million. Um, but because we did have lower expenses throughout the year, uh, we did come in at a net income about $5 million above budget uh, at about $17 million. So we, we did have a, a good year on the electric system this past fiscal year. Moving to the water system, uh, it's a similar story. Uh, our revenues were a bit below budget for the year. Um, primary reason for that was our sales were a little bit above budget, but we had budgeted a rate increase uh, commensurate with the start of the cabin plant expansion. And when that was delayed, we delayed the rate increase. So uh, that uh, budget revenues were a little bit lower than projected because of that. Our actuals, the, uh, actuals relative to budget were lower. Uh, but as, as with the electric side, we were able to manage our expenses very well. Our expenses were 5% below budget, so uh, that overcame the, the less than budget revenue. For a net income, that was about half a million dollars above budget. We budgeted about 500000 and we were at $1.1 million. Uh, so again, and that's really driven by the, uh, some expenses were delayed on the cabin plant, so some of those expenses weren't capture this fiscal year, uh, that'll kind of even itself out as that project is up and running now. Uh, so in summary, we had a good year for, for both uh, the electric and water systems. Uh, we were above our budget on net income for both systems. Uh, our telecommunications division, which is a division of the electric system, was also above budget on net income. Its expenses were down and revenues were up. So uh, that system, as we'll talk about in just a second, is growing and uh, we're very proud of that, how the, the progress we made there. And then, as I mentioned, the water system had a positive net income above budget. So it was a good year for both the electric and water systems for, for, for the city. Talk about a three, three slides on three things that are, are projects that we've been working on and give you a little bit of an update. The first one is the power supply. Uh, we've talked about this quite a bit. Uh, as, as you know, we, uh, our IRP process that we did determined that we should shut down the Elmer Smith Station. So we actually shut unit one off. Uh, on June 8th of this past of this year, so this past June 8th, and we we're going to shut Unit 2 down on June 1 of 2020, and that's when our Big Rivers uh, Purchase Power Agreement takes effect. So, as of June 1 of 2020, you see on the pie chart, uh, we'll be getting about 95% uh, of our of our power from Big Rivers. We also have power. We get power from the Southeast Power Administration. It's hydropower from from the federal government. That's about 5% of our of our need. And then in December of 2022, we'll have another source coming in of solar power uh, with our Ashwood solar contract. Uh, that facility is going to be built in Lyon County. It is on schedule to be completed at the end of 2022. And when that comes online, we'll take about 5% of our power from that solar facility. And that will, uh, then we'll that will decrease the amount of power we take from Big Rivers when that comes online. So we're in good shape on power supply. All those plans are moving forward. We are moving forward with uh, getting ready to uh, shut down Elmer Smith Unit 2 on June 1 and move into the Big Rivers uh, PPA. What kind of job loss are we talking about with both of those plants decommissioned? Uh, in production, we have about 84 employees that do electric and water treatment. Um, we're going to have about 21 left for water, so we're looking at 60, 63 to 64 jobs that will, that will, that's the unfortunate part of this, that we will lose some jobs uh, in Elmer, at Elmer Smith. Thank you. Uh, our water treatment plant modernization, that project is going very well. As you recall, um, we're expanding the cabin treatment plant uh, by 20 million gallons a day. So it'll go from 10, uh, current capacity of 10, up to 30 million gallons per day. 
Uh, that number was chosen because of the issues we have with Plan A. <laughs> it's aging infrastructure there and our settlement issues that we've talked about. Plan A is currently at 18 million gallons, so when the cabin plant is up and running with the full expansion, that will effectively replace the capacity from Plan A and we will shut down Plan A. Um, and that schedule is we began uh, construction this past February. It's about a two-year construction, so we'll substantially complete construction in February of 21. Uh, we'll be starting that, putting that new plant online in the spring of 21. And then uh, as soon as it gets up and running and online and all the uh, commissioning activities are, are over, probably early summer of 21, we'll begin the process to shut down Plan A. And the good news is that project is on schedule and on budget. So that's going very well for us. And you've probably seen the, all the work out around the power plant with the, uh, the work at the cabin plant as well as the new transmission pipeline that we're, uh, that's uh, moving down from uh, cabin plant down toward uh, uh, the Wing Avenue area. So all that work is going very well. Kevin, uh, what's going to happen with the property where the old water plant is? As of right now, we're going to look at how we're going to decommission it and, and take the plant out of service. Then, you know, we'll have to talk with our commission about what they want to do with that property moving forward. Uh, we do have infrastructure still on that property. We have a substation <laughs> on that property as well as some wells on that property. But um, we'll look at that. It, it won't, we won't have a, a use for the majority of it. So there may be opportunities down the road for others to uh, come in and, and they have use of that property for us to transfer it. But no decisions have been made at this point. Thank you. Uh, and then the other thing I mentioned briefly is our fiber net and our fiber to the home. Uh, if you can see this map up here, uh, on the lower left, the two, uh, the, the gray, blue gray, and the kind of the pinkish, those are the areas that we have uh, already completed the build out and we are uh, installing customers in those areas. Uh, in the middle of the screen, the blue area, we're gonna start construction on that shortly after the first of the year. Uh, and that's roughly bounded by uh, West Byers Avenue, um, South Griffith, Griffith Avenue, and uh, New Hartford Road. Uh, so that is our next area we'll be going into. Uh, we're taking sign-ups for that now, so if you live in that area, uh, contact us. We can sign you up, put you on the list, so when the infrastructure is there next year, we'll, we'll start in installations. And then beyond that, we'll be moving um, across New Hartford Road uh, in the area that's over to 54 and Parish Avenue. Uh, that's the next segment in the next, next fiscal year, and then uh, into the green segment and then finally in fiscal 23 uh, the the kind of the purplish blue at the top uh, uh, the northern part of our north the northeast and northwest part of our territory so uh, that's going very well and we're very happy that uh, that we can uh, you know we've we've met our goals our financial and our sign-up goals and we are happy to take customers in those areas that are available and uh, if you're in an area that's not available we're coming we're coming your way so what a, what it would What's, what would slow you down in this process? What are the, you know, this, the pitfalls of this expansion? There's not a lot that would slow us down. Uh, we're, you know, we're building out on our existing electric system infrastructure. So we've got that infrastructure there. Um, we've got the funding lined out. So um, the, the only thing that would slow us down if the business did, did not materialize, but we are getting um, customers sign up as they're available on our schedule. So. Uh, the only thing I think would slow us down is if the business just didn't show up, but it is. We're having people that are, you know, wanting us to get to their neighborhood, so that's a good problem to have. Yeah, I've n everyone I've talked to that has your service just tickled to death with it. So when are you going to bring it, like, to City Hall so we could pilot test it for you? <laughs> well, now, you'd be a commercial customer. We'd have to talk a little bit different about oh, that. Oh, <laughs> there's always something. Yeah, okay, just checking. So let's talk a little bit about the bond refunding and, and redemption. Uh, main reason we're here tonight for this ordinance. Um, and we've talked about this before, so I, I'm, not go I'm gonna skip over some of this a little bit, just hit the high points. Um, but you know, we got here, how did we get here? We started this IRP, this integrated resource planning process and power supply way back in 2013. Uh, ultimately, re the result of that was is that um, moving forward, we needed to get out of the, uh, of the power generation business. Uh, so we've accomplished that with the purchase, power purchase agreements with Big Rivers and the solar. And the reason, the driving force behind that is because uh, it, it helps us to lower rates to our customers. And we were in a, uh, a situation where we were, we were having uh, rather frequent rate increases. And now as you'll see from some future slides and what I, we've already said is we expect to have rate decreases. Um, 
So, and our goal was rate stability. To stabilize rates, we've actually been able to start projecting that we're going to lower rates. So we've, we've far surpassed that goal with this action. Um, we did have to take some action um, that, we, uh, that was approved uh, in, by, by this commission and our commission in the spring to increase our base rate, but we, at the same time we lowered our, our ECA component of our rate, so the overall rate did go down. Uh, and that had to do with our debt service coverage, which I'll talk a little bit about later, and we talked about before. Uh, but the bottom line is um, our rates did go down on, on June 1st of this year, and we expect them to go down uh, each year after, thereafter in the next five years with this plan. Uh, on the next slide, our financial planning assumptions. Just hit a couple of these. As I mentioned, uh, Elmer Smith's Unit 1 has shut down on June 8th, and Elmer Smith Unit 2 is going to shut down on June 1 of 2020. And the bottom bullet on capital, um, we are not planning on any, uh, in this forecasted period, any additional new capital for new projects. So the refunding we're doing is strictly to, to refund or refinance existing bonds. There's no new money included for new projects. We're going to finance our capital projects for this period out of our existing rates and reserves. So there'll be no new, new debt issued uh, for that. And that includes our telecom expansion. So we're going to fund the telecom as well. Uh, we, our original plan had been to bond that entire expansion. Now we're going to be able to fund part of that out of reserves. Just what are your reserves, Kevin? I knew you were going to ask that question. I'm sorry to blindside you with that. I should have. Um, we have we have a lot of reserves that are restricted, which we have they're set aside for other for different functions for bond covenants and whatnot. But as of right now, our unrestricted reserves are about 49 million dollars uh, of reserves, and that's you know those are uh, we're going to use part of those for this uh, bond uh, redemption, and moving forward, uh, you know we've got reserves to cover it, as you'll see in the presentation, to cover other things we have coming up, including those capital projects. Thank you. Um, this, is, this slide right here is the reason we had to have the base rate increase, because we had to cover our debts. Uh, one of the requirements we have in our financial metrics is to maintain our debt service coverage ratio at a level above one, at one or above, and without the action that we took uh, in, in the spring and this action, you can see the red line, we were not going to make that, and that, that's not acceptable. So with this plan, you can see the debt service coverage, the white line does stay above uh, the requirement for, for, the, for the forecasted period. A and the debt service is it's just, it's, it's uh, fairly simply, it's our annual revenue divided by uh, the amount of, of debt service we have. So, and it's a year over, it's a, each year has to stand on its own. So if you have a really good year, say that first bullet is, is fairly high, you can't use that for the next year. Each year has to stand on its own. So that's why um, we have to stay above one for every year. Talk a little bit about uh, our revenue requirements as we move forward with this plan. Um, you can see on this slide the, uh, the blue bar, the takeaway on this slide is the blue bar is our total uh, O&M requirement. And most of that uh, is related to power production. Um, and then the, uh, the, the, the uh, pink or red bar, I guess, is debt service. And you can see how the total goes down as this plan is implemented and Elmer Smith is shut down beginning in fiscal 21. The red line at the top, if you go back two years with our projection, we are projecting that that revenue requirement would have been significantly higher if we had stayed, uh, kept operating Elmer Smith through 2023, which would have meant additional rate increases and not rate uh, decreases. So it just verifies that the choice we made to, uh, to shut down Elmer Smith and move out of power generation was the right choice for our customers. On our retail side, uh, our cost of supply, our biggest cost is power. That's the blue bar, uh, and you can see uh, the blue and the red bar. The blue bar is our power that we generate at Elmer Smith. Uh, the red bar is backup in the first three years is backup power, power that we need to buy when Elmer Smith uh, can't supply the city's need. And you can see that flips beginning in 2021. The Elmer Smith costs go way down and that uh, red bar increases and that's where the purchase power agreement with Big Rivers kicks in and now we're purchasing most of our power as opposed to generating it. Uh, there is some of the blue uh, moving forward in time. The Elmer Smith costs don't go away as soon as we shut down the plant. There are some fixed costs and other operating costs that we have to maintain moving forward. But as you can see, it's drastically reduced. And this is the good news slide. Um, this is our projected residential rate. The green line is what we were, uh, presented to you in April of this year. 
and since then with uh, with the new uh, the new uh, re uh, projection that we did this this uh, fall uh, you can see that we're still in the same basic trend but we're even a little bit more of a rate decrease is projected as we move forward in time so every year year over year we're projecting our rates uh, our overall rate to go down and we use the residential as a uh, it's easy to to understand but all of our rate classes follow the same uh, the same path <clears throat> the next slide is to give you an idea of their components of our rates and, and and what's changing to let our rates go down so the red bar uh, you know our rates have three components the base rate which is blue on this graph the ECA it's our energy cost adjustment which is green and then the red is our ECCA which is where we recover environmental control costs at Elmer Smith and then the white bar is the total. So each one of these, every time the bar is below zero, that means it's a decrease from the previous year. They're not cumulative. So you can see uh, what's driving our rate decreases are the ECA, the ECA is going down quite significantly. So we're having a rate decrease year over year. Uh, we are projecting in 2024 that we're gonna need a fairly small uh, base rate increase of about two and three quarter percent in 2024 and 2025. But if you look at the white line, the white line is still below the line. That means that uh, our ECA rate and ECCA rate decreases more than offset the base rate increase. So our rates are continuing to move downward. Um, the question you ask about reserves, this, this gives you a kind of a graphical idea of what our, what our reserves are, are, are doing. <clears throat> the bars are uh, our debt service. The red is the Elmer Smith debt. That's by far our largest uh, uh, debt we have. Uh, the um, yellow or orange are distribution system debt. And the little blue bar on top is our telecom debt for the bonding that we've already done. And you can see over time our debt service is declining with this under this plan. And then the green bars, that's, uh, that's a, uh, an estimation of the, uh, the reserves and cash that we'll have available above and beyond all those restricted and those other requirements we have to maintain uh, to operate the, the utility. And you can see when you get to fiscal 24, uh, we would have enough cash on hand and reserves to completely pay off all the outstanding debt of the, of the electric system. Uh, and as those green dots show, uh, moving forward in time, we're in a good position with reserves and, and in a cash position, uh, which is a good thing because as you know, the Big Rivers Agreement is a six and a half year agreement. We'll be doing another IRP in the next couple of years to look at what's our source of power beyond that. And it'll be good to be uh, out of debt uh, practically and have uh, cash on hand for those future, whatever the project might be or whatever the contracts might be that come up. So uh, the ordinance for consideration is, it authorizes up to us to use up to uh, $15 million of reserves. We're actually projecting about 12, 12 and a half, 12.7 million dollars and $17.4 million of accrued debt service funds that, that might come available with this refunding to pay off our series 1991B and portions of our 2010 and 2013 series bonds. Um, so it authorized, so that's the, the paying down the debt and we're refunding another $88.3 million of the series 2010 and 2013 bonds uh, by issuing up to $80 million in bond proceeds. We're actually projecting that at 76.6 million. Uh, it does not extend the term of the bond, so we're not spreading the debt out to get lower debt service annually. It's the, the uh, term is the same as it is today. And we're, as I said, we're not including any new funds for any new projects. Um, so in summary, um, it'll save us about $24.5 million over the, nine year, over the next nine years uh, without extending bond terms and without any new money. Uh, and one thing is, uh, we're taking advantage of low interest rates. You know, the interest rate average for these bonds is around up, upper three or four percent, and we're projecting to be below 1.7 percent. We don't know for sure yet, but that's what we're projecting. So, so all the bonds that are available that we can <coughs> refund, we are refunding. So there, there's no, we're not leaving anything on the table with respect to that. As I said, capital projects in our forecast period are gonna be funded from our rates, so there's no new financing projected. And uh, I'll say it again, we're still projecting OMU's overall electric rate to de decrease in each of the next five fiscal years. And without this plan, if we did not do this, we would be coming back to you for a base rate increase uh, this year. So uh, this plan is, is critical to that, uh, to that financial plan that we've got moving forward and really is going to allow us to be uh, 
uh, reducing rates to our customers, which is something that's rare in our business, uh, and also put us on sound financial footing for the future. So we're uh, very happy with this plan and, and we're, we're looking forward to implementing it and moving forward. And that was all I had. I have questions. Happy for questions. I ask Mr. Condon. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Kevin, great conversation you and I had a couple of weeks ago concerning this, but uh, thank you to the staff for putting everything together and r except for the chair of the board, JT, you know, whatever. Uh, but it truly is astounding to see that uh, in hopefully 2024, OMU will be basically debt free. That is a great statement to make that you, and you have two years then to be able to come up with the next power purchase plan, I assume, uh, at the end of the Big Rivers contract to figure out what you're going to be doing going forward. So during those two years would seem to be a very busy time. Maybe you'll still be around to do so, I assume. <laughs> It will so, absolutely be a busy time. Yes, it will be. But I, I thank you for all the work. It's great to see the rates continuing to go down, down, down. Thank and you very much. We, we, we use a lot of consultants, but a lot of this, uh, this, is work, this work is done in-house. Uh, Lynn is our Director of Finance Accounting. She does a great job. And as you mentioned, uh, Commissioner Condor, she's instrumental in this, as well as back in the back, Jason Potts, their Manager of Planning. So uh, those two folks have really been uh, instrumental in, in making this happen. So do you have any idea what the future holds? It's uh, lower rates. <laughs> Other than that, how, how, the, how power may come about. You know, that's, when we do the IRP, the good thing about IRP is all things are on the table. We start with a blank slate. We will look at everything from, from you know, purchase power agreements to partnering with others in generation to building our own generation um, as we did before and vet all those very carefully. So we come up with the, with the plan that we move forward that provides the lowest and most economical cost to our customers, which is, which is our mission. Uh, so the good thing about the IRP is, is when you do that, you look at all those things, and uh, some of it's a little bit predicting the future. Uh, one of the reasons that we did not get into a long-term agreement with this current plan is, as you know, uh, Commissioner Condor, our business is changing rapidly um, with the natural gas markets, uh, with the uh, increase in renewables and the renewables markets and with the retirement of coal plants across the country. And we didn't want to get locked into something that may be a transient as our business kind of readjusts where, it, where it's going to be for the next 20 years. Uh, so we think uh, our commission, I think, was wise in, in, in limiting that uh, agreement to six and a half years and giving us time to look forward for what's coming up next in our business. And it seems as if one of your biggest challenges is your territory is locked in. Absolutely. You're bordered on all sides by anybody else that's producing power. So everything, your anticipated growth has to come within the boundaries that you're dedicated by the federal government, correct? Correct. That is your biggest, seems to be one of your biggest challenges that you will have. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Mayor. Welcome. Commissioner Smith-Wright. Yes. Uh, Kevin, I'm, out of the 60 uh, employees that are, that are going to lose their job, are, th are most of them close to retirement or? It's across the board. We have a few that are close to retirement, um, but, but no, uh, our, I think our average tenure out there is, is somewhere in the you know, 15 to 20 year range. So, uh, so some of them will be able to retire. Some of them are gonna be just short and some of them are fairly uh, relatively uh, uh, you know, new employees, you know, five or six years experience. Uh, what we've done, and spending 27 years at the power plant, you know, this is, uh, you know, near and dear to my heart. I, I, I uh, never thought I'd be the uh, general manager who closed Elmer Smith down because I just never thought it would happen. But uh, those employees, uh, we're we're doing the best we can to take care of them. We have a retention plan in place so that as uh, as they uh, as we as we cease to need their services, as we get past that June 1, 2020 date. Um, those employees that stayed with us will get a retention bonus um, to help them in their you know, next phase of their careers. And uh, it's beneficial to us because it's helped us to retain valuable, experienced employees. We have not had a lot of attrition um, that you would expect because unlike a lot of places, you know, these employees have known for quite some time that, that their job had an end date on it. And most places you don't get that much uh, of a heads up. And they stuck with us, and we appreciate that. And, and so the retention plan we have in place is going to reward them from that and hopefully soften the landing for those. Uh, you know, as I said, 84 of the 84 head count, a few of them will stay on and work in the water, in the water treatment plants. Uh, but the vast majority of them, we just, we're, 
Production is our biggest department, so we can't absorb them into the rest of the utility. Uh, so we will have, by necessity, a reduction in, in headcount. Is there any um, plan to help them relocate some, you know, to another job or anything like that? I mean, will you all help facilitate them? We, we have a plan to give them some outplacement uh, services. Uh, we'll probably work with the community college and others who to help them, you know, with things like resume writing and, mm -hmm. and identifying uh, jobs for those that are interested. Uh, the good thing about uh, a lot of our folks have some very marketable skills, and so you know I, I'm, I'm hopeful that that many of them will find other positions. But um, but we're going to help them in every way we can, and we do have that uh, that uh, plan in place to have help them with outplacement skills and uh, you know job placement once we get to the point where we're where we're laying people off. Okay, I certainly thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Anybody else? <coughs> Kevin, great job. Just like the OMU's in good hands. And uh, we appreciate all that you do. And you come and tell us the story and you tell it to where we can understand it. That's, well, that's helpful you. too because it's pretty complicated <laughs> stuff. Thank, thank you. Thank you. All right. Okay, next item on the agenda is uh, Municipal Order 8A, Councilor. Municipal Order 27 2019, a municipal order authorizing and directing the mayor to execute a memorandum of agreement with Cedarhurst of Owensboro Real Estate, LLC, providing for the consensual annexation of unincorporated property located in Davis County, located at 1900 Pleasant Valley Road and Highway 603, containing seven acres more or less, and further providing that the city shall reimburse Cedarhurst for the cost of construction of various public facilities dedicated to public use for said property and maintenance within or for the uh, direct benefit of said tract in any amount not to exceed the total cost of the public facilities or the total ad valorem net profits and occupational tax revenues derived from the property, whichever is less over a designated eight year period. Introduced and publicly read for approval this 15th day of October, 2019. Thanks, Councilor. I'll make a motion to approve. Could I have a second, please? Second. City Manager, would you like to make a comment? Uh, yes, Mayor, thank you. You're welcome. This municipal order authorizes an annexation incentive agreement for the Cedarhurst project for which we had second reading earlier in this meeting. This is our standard incentive allowing the company to recoup incremental taxes for eight years up to or not exceeding the cost of their public infrastructure. Okay. Any other discussion? Hearing none, all in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 All opposed, motion carries. Thank you. Item nine, city manager items. Uh, yes, Mayor. Angela Hamrick will present the July and August financial reports. Ms. Hamrick. Uh, yes, Mayor and Commission. Um, I will present uh, the August report and uh, refer to the July report by exception if anyone has any questions. Thank you. Uh, the refin financial report for the month ended um, August 31st. Our general fund revenues through August of $8,089,252 were $156,278 over budget. This is primarily due to occupational tax withholding. Our general fund expenditures of $9,211,354 were $1,229,289 under budget. This is primarily due to timing in maintenance, supplies, and capital. Outside of timing variances, the revenues and expenditures and other funds are in line with the budget. If anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Any questions? Okay, uh, make a motion to file for audit. Second. More discussion. Hearing none, all in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 All opposed, motion carries. Is that all you have, Ms. Hammer? Thank you. I thought you might speak to the Moody thing. Is that later I'm, on? I'm happy to if, if, you, if you want me to I'd at this point. I'd love for you to talk about that, please. Okay, I'd, I'd be happy to. Um, we uh, did a refinancing of uh, three bond issues. Um, we uh, got upgraded by Moody's uh, for the first time since uh, since 2010. Mm -hmm. yes. I'll have to admit I was pretty excited, probably more so than the normal person might have been. Nate's laughing because he saw how excited hey, I was. You're jumping around like yeah, a kid. Yeah, I was. I was Halloween. jumping around like like a kid. Um, I, I was just so excited to to get that. Um, 
And I know Don Wilkins called and, and asked me um, a few questions about it and asked if I was surprised. And, and I actually was not surprised. I was uh, hopeful that uh, Moody's would give us this upgrade. Uh, and as the newspaper article mentioned today, you know, in, in years past when we had been downgraded, uh, you know, Moody's would give suggestions as to what could improve our rate. And uh, I have to commend the commission for allowing us to take those steps to, to uh, improve our financial condition um, and look toward reducing our debt. And so um, kudos to the commission. And uh, I'm, I'm thankful to, uh, to announce that we are upgraded to an A1. Um, for those who haven't read the paper today, uh, we're going to save uh, over $3.4 million in interest expense. Um, and I wanted to mention, um, if you did read the paper today, um, it did mention uh, that this $3.4 million would be interest uh, savings over the next 30 years. And I just wanted to mention um, we did not extend the life of any of these bonds. We, we kept with the original um, uh, termination matur maturity date and so there is no extension of time and uh, one of these bonds you know is only 20 years and so um, I just wanted to make that clarification I didn't want anyone out there to think that we had extended the length of the bonds we kept the same maturity date for those but um, anyway I was just excited and, and pleased and um, glad to see it Good job thank you for letting me speak to that very well. Awesome. Okay. Item 9B, consider personnel appointments, please. Yes, sir. Hunter Reagan, probationary, full-time, non-civil service appointment to engineering technician with Public Works, effective October 28th. Damon Brandel, Joshua Jones, Coy Murphy, Cody Ramberger, and Jordan Roberts, probationary, full-time, non-civil service appointments to firefighter, effective November 11th. Jason D. or J.D. Winkler, probationary, full-time, non-civil service promotional appointment to major with the police department, effective October 27th. Grant Hare, probationary, full-time, non-civil service promotional appointment to lieutenant with the fire department, effective November 10th. Colby Grayson and Stephen Redis, probationary, full-time, non-civil service promotional appointments to driver or engineer with the fire department, effective December 8th. And Susan Frazier, regular, full-time, non-civil service appointment to bus driver with the transit department effective October 29th. Thank you. I make a motion to approve those personnel appointments. Could I have a second, please? Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 All opposed, motion carries. Thank you, city manager. Item 10, 10 communications from elected officials. Commissioner Sanford. Um, tonight. Oh, you got another one? I don't see it. No, he's Oh, you got comments. Excuse me, Commissioner Sanford. City manager is going to make his own comments now. Sorry <laughs> about that. <laughs> Item 9C, uh, City Manager Nate Pagan would like to make a comment, please. Yes, sir. Uh, leave pickup begins next week, Mayor, and I would ask if you would call Deputy Director of Public Works, Stephen Franklin, to give us a quick update on that. Do you want to talk about that, Steve? Sure. Okay, but make your way to the podium. Please state your name and address for the record. Thank you, Mayor, <coughs> Commission, Stephen Franklin, Deputy Director of Public Works. Um, like Nate said, uh, I'm going to give you a, a brief rundown of the upcoming leaf season for 2019-2020. Um, it officially kicks off uh, this upcoming Monday, October 21st, and it'll be wrapping up February 14th of 2020. Um, during this time, we'll be uh, completing three passes. Um, each pass consists of 10 zones. Um, this year, we'll be starting in zone seven. Um, we always start, last year we started in zone six. This year, we're doing seven. Next year, will be eight. We always start in the zone uh, after uh, the previous year. Um, this year, zone seven, like I said, which is kind of uh, located on the west central part of town. It is Griffith to Sherm. Frederick of the bypass. Um, before the each season starts, we always like to set goals. You know, target dates for each each pass. Um, this year's goals for the first pass, which starts October 21st, um, our goal is November 15th. For the second pass, is November 16th through December 20th. Third pass is December 21st through February 14th. 
Now this third pass also um, includes call-ins. So typically the third pass will end about second, possibly third week of January. At that point, we'll continue picking up leaves until February 14th, but we'll do on a, on a call-in call -in basis. So how it works, it, there's really three means of disposal of leaves. The first is uh, we've got leaf trucks. So we've got three trucks with leaf machines that go around town. Um, each truck has uh, three employees. You got a driver, you got somebody raking, you got somebody manning the hose. Um, all six vehicles will operate in the same zone before uh, they move to the next. So for example, um, this year we're starting in zone seven. So all six trucks will work in zone seven. Once they get that complete, they'll move to eight and then nine and so on. Option two is uh, bagged leaves. We've got two trucks uh, which are equipped with uh, two employees. They'll go around town collecting bag leaves. Um, the schedule for this will be on your regular scheduled trash day. So if your trash day is collected on Tuesday, then they'll pick up your bag leaves on Tuesday as well. Third option is we've got uh, drop off location. We've got six orange dumpsters that are located at uh, the sports center. These are open for city residents. If they like to, to utilize that, drop their, their bag leaves there. So how do we uh, track the progress? Well, each day we will update the city website stating where we're gonna be the, the following day. Um, we'll also reach out to the newspaper, to radio station, WBIO, Channel 75, letting them know where we'll be the following day. That way people can kinda uh, know, know when we'll service them. So just a few notes. First, uh, just let residents know that when they rake their leaves that we want to get them curbside, but we want to keep the leaves in the yards. So we don't want to get them out in the streets. We don't want to get them in the gutters and things like that. We don't want to cross or uh, get in sidewalks. Um, second thing is when, when they're raking these piles, uh, make sure they're, they're not blocked by vehicles, trailers, put over utility meters or anything like that. Third, we don't want to contaminate these pile of leaves. So no loose limbs, no trash, no debris, anything like that. Um, so that's the gist of it, you know, uh, that's it in a nutshell. Um, one thing uh, I would like to state, I thought it was pretty interesting. Um, last year we collected 1,602 tons of leaves. That's equivalent to 3,204,000 pounds. So I thought that was pretty, pretty impressive, uh, quite a bit of, of leaves. But uh, anyhow, I'd uh, be happy to answer any questions you might have. How many was that? <laughs> 1,602 tons or 3,204,000 pounds. How many leaves? God. <laughs> <laughs> no telling. One question. Uh, how do you control just city residents putting them in the orange dumpster? It's kind of hard. It's kind of the honor system. <laughs> honor you system. know, we, okay. we do patrol it, but it's hard to patrol okay. some 24 7. I'm just curious if they had a little. We, it, th we've got signs and, and things like that, but. <laughs> yeah. Yes, okay. sir. It's 35 mile an hour speed limit. Everybody goes 45. Yeah. yeah, okay. Yes, sir. All right, Stephen. Great job. Any questions from the commission? Thank you. Good job. Thank you very much. Is it okay that I go on now, city manager? Okay. Item 10 communication from elected officials. Commissioner, you going to say something this time? Yeah. Okay. Go, Commissioner Sanford. Okay. Uh, just a couple of quick comments. Uh, of course, my day job is real estate, and I think it's kind of cool that I was contacted by a lady out of Portland, Oregon, to show her our city because she was considering living here because of the green belt. And I think living here, we kind of overlook things and things we have to do and things we have to offer. And uh, she found us on the internet out of everywhere in the country just because we have the green belt. And I think that's pretty cool that we have a lot of things to offer in a city our size. And someone would come, be looking at us from that far away and actually flew into town and I showed her the town. But it, it, it's pretty neat to show people stuff like that. And uh, I just thought I'd mention that. Uh, a lot of times we do overlook all the cool things we have because we live here. But uh, anyway, it's kind of a positive story. Thank you. Yeah. On that point, could is it out of order to ask uh, Leland to kind of give us a little update on where we are on the finishing? Of, are you going to do? We don't ever have a work session anymore. So. Kevin Cullion, another precinct heard from. He's got a tie on tonight too. Look at him. <laughs> Get him smiley.
Come on. Hi, Kevin. <laughs> Good evening, Mayor and Commissioners. Um, Where do you probably, live? Could I have your address, please, for the oh, record? Uh, uh. 6555 Foster Road. You live in the county? Yes, I do. Yeah, we've, we've got a couple <laughs> more more weeks to finish that up. Just a few uh, minor details left out there. So. How about that? On the East Trail project. Okay. Is, what's going on in front of the hospital? Is that a connector by any chance for the green belt at all? It's right. Have you seen that? It's, it's, hmm? That OMU digging a hole? Okay. Never mind. <laughs> uh, <laughs> 36 inch transmission main. Okay. So, uh, so it won't connect out through there then? Well, we, uh, with the Cedarhurst development, uh, we have a, a piece of uh, green belt that's that's going there and then so if that property um if to the south but between that and the old uh lagoon lane mm -hmm. there bar debris if, if that develops we will we will try to get that connected up there too from the east trail so so we're trying to get over to the hospital and and, and a lot that, of people out there ask about that when i go out there you know if they're going to have a connector of some sort so that's why i was asking yes sir yeah so the the cedarhurst it's it's planned there um, and like I say, if that other lot develops, we'll, we'll connect the, to the East Trail, and then, and then we just have to work across 603 to get to the hospital. You know. So. Okay. Thank you, Kevin. You're welcome. And you can blame Leland, uh, Commissioner Condor. Thank you, Mayor. To um, piggyback just a little bit on what Commissioner Sanford talked about this weekend, a uh, individual yelled at me across the parking lot and wanted to talk. After he introduced himself, he had a black jacket on with uh, a black knight. On the, on the shoulder and he and his wife were going down to Bowling Green to watch Western play Army is what they were going to be doing and he is a city councilman for Terre Haute Indiana and he was wanting to know how Owensboro created its riverfront and downtown and everything else that's got going on in its city uh, Terre Haute is one of those smaller cities that is somewhat struggling as he, he put it a little differently than that but he applauded how much the people talked to him, talked to him and his wife, uh, how well everything was maintained, how all the trash and everything else that just looked, looked awesome. And he wanted to know how it was done. And he said, I'd like to bring a group down sometime uh, maybe in the spring from Terre Haute as they move forward with their convention center, their Larry Bird Museum that they're gonna be putting in place and how that can be done to make sure it's done correctly. So. Uh, good stories happen all the time. Sometimes they just need to be told. Thank you, Mayor. You're welcome. Mayor Pro Tem, Maglinger. Thank you, Mayor. You're I welcome. Okay. Commissioner Pam Smith Wright. Thanks, Mayor. You're welcome. Um, just wanted to say that um, yesterday I was fortunate enough to uh, be one of the original members of Healthy Horizons, and we met. Um, at the health park again and for their 20th anniversary I mean not it was Monday and uh, well it was yesterday right <laughs> but anyway it was it was just good to see um, that they are still moving and doing things and and one of the things that we talked about when we first started that was uh, ridding smoking in our community to make it a healthier place and uh, and those of us who were on the commission when we passed that smoking bill was like really tough but anyway but it's made us a, a better place for all of us to live and um, also I'd like to thank you mayor for that heartfelt uh, prayer you did tonight because those of us who um, know Gary we know that he will be missed in this community so thank you you're very welcome okay I have a couple of things I want to uh, talk about methamphetamines you know I've been watching the discretionary funding that's been coming from Washington, D.C. for opioids in Eastern Kentucky. So I contacted some people up there and then I contacted Dr. Ros how you say it? Ron Ronsalin? Rosalind? She's the guru about here and so uh, about how we could get in that feeder system, <laughs> what I call it. And all the funding grants uh, expired November of 19. So I contacted uh, Joanna Shake at the at grad, and um, we are going to be presenting a, we kind of tentatively call it Davis County versus meth in the sports vernacular, but 
uh, Adrian, my assistant, and Jenny Warren at fiscal court. Uh, we're going to try and do a joint session of the city commission and the fiscal court uh, to give a presentation about meth. And Dr. Clark's going to do most of the talking. And we're going to invite all the participants uh, across this community uh, to have a to be there to hear so that when these grant opportunities uh, uh, come out again uh, we'll be ready to go because there's some for law enforcement there's some for drug court there's some for family drug court and there's just really a, a myriad of, of opportunities to apply for funding from the federal government to combat meth and and most everybody agrees we have a larger meth problem here than we have opioid so um, in the, hopefully we can put this it's hard to get seven people to agree on a time to meet but uh, we're going to work on that in the next uh, week or so to see if we can give a presentation because there's you know there's so many opportunities that are out there to because the president has made that a, a you know key st uh, staple of his uh, department of his presidency to try and uh, you know fight the drug abuse things and we'll have rehab law enforcement corrections um, it's it should be pretty nice uh, we're going to do it and Al and I have talked a little bit about it and and I think Dr. Clark has talked to him and uh, uh, Judge Mattingly from fiscal court so it ought to be a pretty interesting thing and we hope we can uh, get ourselves lined up to have the opportunity. It doesn't mean to guarantee that you're going to do the grants, but with Joanne running it out at grad and, and I was uh, her Skylar, she's uh, really sharp and, and she presented quite a bit of information to me about how we could get this done. So I'm excited about that uh, because there's no reason why we can't at least apply for some grant funding to combat this uh, dreaded uh, disease I call it so that's coming uh, on a similar note I visited with the Friends of Sinners um, men's house the other day and spoke with Joe and his uh, PR guy and they really got a lot of good things going there and I just wanted to tell everybody that there's a uh, Friends of Center uh, uh, banquet it's their 10th anniversary and um, you can call Jessica Lee at 270 9770 and they're going to have a guest speaker, Pastor Bill Reisner, from uh, founder of Encounter Ministries. And, um, you know, with all these job openings and all the places in Kentucky that we're short on, uh, you know, mid range manufacturing jobs, you know, and with people getting their, uh, uh, I don't know what it's called, expunge their record. You know, there's an opportunity for drug rehab and people to get back in the private sector to um, become uh, tax-paying citizens, so to speak. So uh, I'll tell you that it, it, it's going to be at, um, at Orangeburg Christian Church on November the 12th. So it would be nice if we could have a good showing out there for that. Um, as always, let, uh, memo uh, Memorial uh, Veterans Day, the Veterans Day weekend. And, and I got knocked over by uh, Kathy Mullins today. It's going to be a great weekend. They've got a 5K one-mile run for little fellers and breakfast at the VFW, a veterans parade, a cruising style car show. And they're going to have a military ball uh, in, uh, for on Saturday. And then there will be a concert for Faith and Country at the Bluegrass Museum and Hall of Fame. So uh, kind of keep that in mind. It's a great way to, uh, to support uh, – the Brandon Scott Memorial Fund, and, it, and it's a it's tax deduction 5013C. So um, it's a it's a great weekend for our veterans. I was there today when they shipped shipped off. When I when the honor flight folks left, they were biggest group I've ever seen. I think there were 30 something, and and now that we have losing over a thousand World War II guys a day and gals, uh, they have Vietnam as their main group that are going to Washington DC and Keith Kane and uh, does a fabulous job I've been a guardian and if anybody ever wants to volunteer for something that you can really get something out of it you'd be a guardian on one of these trips and I'm telling you 
and just bring this tissue paper with you because you, you'll be balling all the way over there. It's quite a trip. You leave on here today, they leave at noon or one, and then they go to Louisville, spend the night, and get up at five o'clock in the morning, go to the airport, and you leave uh, the airport in Louisville and fly to Baltimore, BWI. You get on a bus, and then you drive to Washington, D.C., and then you hit the World War II, Korea, Vietnam Memorial, Iwo Jima. And these, some of these folks are 90 years old. And then you get back on the bus about 6 o'clock, drive back to Baltimore, get on a plane, and come back to, to uh, Louisville, and then check them in the hotel. And the only guys that were up uh, when we got back, to, when I went, was all the veterans. All of us were dead, tired, pushing them around and walking and keeping them going in the right direction. But it's a wonderful trip. Uh, we were very thankful that uh, Men Who Cook, uh, sponsored by Old National Bank, uh, they contributed $25,000 to this effort. So they will be well taken care of. And it's, uh, there was probably three or 400 people at the sports center today. And they'll be back in a couple of days and, and it would be nice to have a nice crowd there um, to uh, welcome those cats back. When I went there was a gentleman that, from Indiana. He was a combat participant in World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. And that's pretty remarkable to think that you go through three of those things. I asked him one day that, that when we were riding up there, I said, did you ever think about buying a lottery ticket? I mean, you know, you're a pretty lucky dude, man. Be up there all that time, not get hurt. And he's, I don't like lottery. But it, it's amazing that to listen to these cat stories about what they did so that we could do this. It's it's remarkable. And last thing, I guess I'm on a veterans kick today. Um, when uh, Herschel Woody Williams came to uh, the Bluegrass Museum, was I guess April maybe. We had a dinner. He's a World War II veteran. He gave us that book out there and signed it. Uh, he's five foot six, 145 pounds, 95 years old. Um, we sat and had lunches. He was just so engaging and had all his own teeth, no hearing aids. I mean, I thought I was talking to you know some guy 60 years old, very, very sharp. And he's made it uh, his. Um, purpose in the rest of his life is to put together monuments for Gold Star families. And obviously we have Brandon Mullins, his mom and dad, Tommy and Kathy. And I've been working on uh, trying to raise enough money to get us a, a memorial next to the Shelter Memorial to honor Gold Star families. And he's, uh, I told him his story, he asked me if I ever wore the uniform and I told him no. Got drafted out of college, but they told me I was too heavy. I couldn't get in the Army. And so he laughed. He said, I never heard of that before. He said, uh, and he said, well, they told me I was too short to be in the Marine Corps. So this guy is five foot six, and he's 95 years old. And his opening remarks at the dinner was, you know, I had a nice conversation with your mayor. And uh, he said the Army wouldn't take him because he was too heavy. <laughs> and the Marines didn't want me because I was too short. So they had three pillboxes on the hill at Iwo Jima, which is all volcanic rock and sand. And he had three companies, the rifle companies, pinned down on the beach. And he picked up a flamethrower and he headed up the hill and took out the pillbox on the right. And then that part of the rifle company came up. I'm not real good on this military stuff. And he's five foot six, weighs 135 pounds in a flamethrower outfit weighs 70 pounds. So then he comes back down the hill, picks up another one on the beach, because that was like having a bullseye on you if you carried one of those things in the service. Michael, you probably know a lot more than I do about it. Went up the middle, took out another pillbox, freed that part of the rifle company. Went back down the hill again, picked up another flamethrower, came back up, took out the third pillbox, and all the folks got up the hill. And I just made him a smart aleck. I said, you only got one medal for doing all that? You know, and he just kind of thought it was funny more than anything else. But he was, he, he, it's his foundation that does this um, Gold Star family um, and Gold Star mothers. Uh, and, and so we're 
I'm looking for a few. I'm getting close to having enough money to do it, but I thought I'd throw a little idea out in case anybody had anything that they would like to uh, share with. It'll be right next to the memorial, uh, the shelter memorial, and I think big, uh, Bigfoot. <laughs> I think Leland's already fixed it to where we know where to do it, and it'll be a, a really, really special thing. And and Woody's coming back in August. He just turned 96 the other day, and he's coming back in August, and gonna have we're gonna have another little thing. So it'd be nice if we had all the stuff ready to go by August of next year. So I put this little plea out. Like I said, we're, we're pretty close to having what we need, but, you know, things cost a lot of money. And, uh, but I think it really would be very special as strong military presence as we have in our community. So having said that, I would like to recognize our almost new chief, Howard, and please come to the podium and state your name and address for the record, please. This is called being blindsided. <laughs> but it's really great to have you with us tonight. Uh, my name is James Howard. Uh, you may be mad at me because I also have a county address. But, uh, 2256 uh, Woodstone Court, mm -hmm. out in Deer Valley. It's a Utica address. Uh, my heart's in Owensboro, and I'm open to moving to Owensboro, but I do currently have a county address. But uh, anyway, you want me to answer anything specifically or just talk? No, we just wanted to see it put a face with a name. Cause, oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, like I said, I am James Howard. I've uh, worked for the city for almost 21 years and uh, with the fire department specifically for a little over 16. And uh, I've had the pleasure to work with the outgoing uh, chief, Chief Mitchell, during his tenure. A uh, great deal of respect for him and uh, his succession planning and the things he's done to make our city safer. And uh, he's, he's leaving us soon and we're gonna pick up the ball and keep moving. Uh, uh, we don't wanna rest on our laurels. You know, we've talked about that before never satisfied with how safe the city is, we can always do better. So we look forward to doing that. Well, welcome, thank you very much. Yes. Thank you. Congratulations. Appreciate it. Okay, that's all I've got. Sorry about being so long. I'll make a motion to adjourn. Could have, whoops. Whoops. <laughs> At this time, I'll make a motion to enter into a closed session. Oops, did I do something else? Right? <laughs> we got huh? Public, nobody out there wants to talk. We've been here all this time, haven't we? <laughs> Open public forum. Members of the audience are invited to address the city commission on any matter of public concern that was not on tonight's agenda. Comments are limited to issues within the scope of the responsibility of the commission. Commission meetings are held to conduct business, city business, on for the benefit of Orangeboro residents and taxpayers. At this time, anyone who wishes to address the city commission, please make their way to the podium to be recognized. Speakers must state their name and address for the record. For, and Limit the remarks to three minutes or less. Anybody like to speak? Yes, sir. All right. Yes, my name is Bruce Thomas. I live at 1617 Navajo Drive. And uh, listening to your statements, you've already screwed up my uh, presentation. I'd like to uh, say something to Commissioner Sanford. I was on the original commission that had the foresight or dream of the Green Belt. Never never in our wildest dreams dream that it could be as big as it is it I, I commend the people that have over the years worked on that it is probably a hundred percent more than what we ever thought could have been it again I, I commend the people that are working on that it's a great thing for the community it's a great thing for every every individual to just go out and, and write part of it or all of it if they got the a ambition to Commissioner Condor you talked about downtown my brother is a city commissioner in northern Indiana. He's been, comes down here two or three times a year to play golf with me, and he's, each time he comes down, he's just amazed at downtown. He, he, he wants to know how it was done. I, I keep telling him, I said, well, we'll go downtown, but we never have time because the golf's more important to him. <laughs> now, to get to the less positive thing, and the reason well, I, uh, the reason three minutes, I came here. three minutes are up. <laughs> <laughs> the reason I came here was, um, to talk about the eyesore on Triplet Street and the dissemination of bad information, both positive and negative. Yeah, get that, that mic closer to you. So the the information that's being disseminated, both positive and negative, and information that's being uh, distributed through the community from people from out of the state. Um, and if you want to read this person's information, 
or lack of information, at least from what my perspective is, uh, get on the history of Owensboro and see Save Gabe's Tower. Uh, this guy is out in left field somewhere. I, I, you, you just have to read it if you haven't had the time to read it. Secondly, I think we need a, uh, a discussion, whether it be in the paper, whether it be a forum, to discuss. I know you guys have put out uh, a uh, press, release. press release about having somebody come in. I, I can't see anybody being dumb enough to put money into that money pit, but you know, I'm, I'm not a developer. Don't I don't know. Why don't ask that guy if he wants to buy it? If he I, does I've that. asked him numerous times. <laughs> uh, I said, put your money where your mouth is, and I don't get an answer from him. But anyways, that's beside the point. Um, we need to know, or the public needs to know, exactly how bad that building is. Uh, I, for one, would love to see it gone. I've been here for 40-some years. I've seen it at its heyday, and I now see it as an eyesore for homeless people. I see it for the, the drug use in that community, that part of the community. It needs to be gone. Uh, they, this, people are saying, well, Smothers Park was the same way. Well, I don't think it was anywhere near what it is down there. Um, I would like to know how bad that building is right now. Uh, some are saying that all the asbestos was removed. Some are saying the asbestos hasn't been removed. Some are saying, you know, that it, it's, it's open, so therefore it's a health hazard to the community. I don't know if these answers, you know, if anybody can answer them. I'd just like it be, to, to find out, have it disseminated through the paper. I had written a letter to the paper probably two weeks before you guys, or maybe three weeks before you guys announced that you're putting out bids to repair, demolish, do whatever you're doing. It's never been in the paper. So my feeling, you know, I, we need as a public to know, granted it was a beautiful building, it had its purpose, but like all things, it's had its time, it needs to be put to, put to rest. And, you know, buildings don't last forever. It's very rare that a building will last forever. This building wasn't designed to last forever, regardless of what this joker in California thinks. Um, a so little more information, through the paper or through a forum would be greatly pre I would attend it. Now that I have now reached retirement age, I would love to attend more meetings, and I probably will. Okay. Well, I'm going to ask the city manager to respond by email to you, if we could. Okay. And give you kind of a if 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 you you want us to talk now. You'd like me to. I, I, so, um, and Abby, correct me if I'm wrong. I think at the November work session, we are having a work session next month. We are. We are having a work session next month, and I believe you plan to cover a lot of those topics, right? And we'll talk about Gabe Sauer as one of the items on the agenda. That so is open to the public, and you're retired, you can come. All right. Be, well, uh, I think it's November 10th. If I'm not playing golf, I'll November be there. Uh, <laughs> how bad do you want this information? I, I want it pretty bad. Priorities. Uh, priorities. November 7th is the, is the drop dead for developers to take a look at this, or? Put a put a package in. Yeah. Is that correct? We're going to have a work session on it November the 12th. Come to that, and we'll have your answers for November you. November the 12th. Yes, sir. We're out. It's at noon right here. I'll be here. Okay. Thank you for your time. Mm -hmm. Appreciate right. it. Appreciate you. Anybody else? Okay. I'll make a motion to adjourn. Could I have a second, please? What now? Man, I want to go home so bad. I got volleyball tonight. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. Item 12, closed session. I will make a motion to enter into a closed session under KRS 61.8101B to discuss acquisition or sale of property. Could I have a second, please? Second. All in favor indicate by saying aye. Aye. Thank you very much. We will not have, there will be no action done, okay? All right, let's go to closed sessions.